If you have rheumatoid arthritis, then the medications that you take play an enormous role in your quality of life, not just on the effectiveness that they have on symptom control, but whether or not you're experiencing significant side effects associated with those medications. But one area that is not considered as often as the side effects and the effectiveness of the medication is the impact that the drugs have on your digestive system. We know the very strong connection between dysbiosis, leaky gut, and rheumatoid arthritis severity. And so what about the potential scenario where medications could be actually making that worse? By contrast, could the medications that you're taking actually improve the microbiome and therefore lead to a helpful impact on your long-term prognosis? Those are the questions that we go into in this presentation. It's a presentation I gave on my friend Chef AJ's channel and it can be now shared with you. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, this presentation is called Rheumatoid Arthritis Drugs, Their Potential Impact on Your Gut Health and Healing Strategy. So that's what we're in for today. Well, let me launch in. A quick reminder, I'm Clint Patterson, a rheumatoid arthritis patient now of 17 years. I've created the Rheumatoid Solutions System, which incorporates multiple modalities to reverse inflammatory arthritis symptoms, including strategies around medication, which is what we're going to talk about today. This one has a mega disclaimer because I'm not a doctor. I don't claim to speak on rheumatology topics that are outside of my research area. What we're going to be covering today is the impact of medications on gut health, which is in my research area. Uh, but the information does not constitute medical advice. Do not make any changes to your drugs, treatment, or lifestyle changes before consulting your rheumatologist or primary care physician, because we're going to talk all about drugs today. And so it's tempting if you learn something to want to make some changes. Do not do that. There's probably specific reasons why you're on your meds and talk to your doctor before you do anything. Now, in the last episode with the wonderful Chef AJ, we spoke about uh dietary impact on rheumatoid arthritis. Now that fell within just this quadrant here of the four quadrants that we're going to be covering in this series together. Um, so we've not yet even touched upon mindset, cellular health, or the body solution. We're still, in fact, in this presentation, sticking with the gut. Uh, and this is the gut solution part two. And this is the, uh, the the real highlight I want to make here is this is not going to be a medication bashing session. Quite the contrary. There's, we're going to cover off medications that can support you in your healing mission with inflammatory arthritis and not cause any uh, uh, barring side effects, uh, not cause any counterproductive impact on your gut and therefore enable you to get the best possible quality of life. So it's not a, a medication bashing session. It is a session focused on how do medications affect my gut and therefore affect my ability to reverse one of the underlying causes of the disease. All right. So we've got one slide to transition into today from last time. And what we're looking at here is a cross-sectional view uh, firstly, in this section, a cross-sectional view of the epithelium, which is the gut lining inside your colon or large intestine. So these things here are called colonocytes. And on top, we've got little villi, which help to have increased cross-sectional area to food that's passing through uh, food particles to extract nutrients and so on. And We've got good bacteria sitting on top of a whole bunch of beautiful and crucial mucus that stops things like um, large food particles and viruses and bacteria from getting too close to your bloodstream down here. And this is only one cell. This is absolutely ridiculously thin, right? So we need the mucus to provide this protection. Now, what can happen is if we lose our mucosal protective lining, then we, and if we have inflammation at the gut wall, which, which is one of the most crucial aspects, we can then develop what's called leaky gut. And in between our colonocytes, 
we can get some of the stuff that's meant to be in here ending up in here. And this causes an immune response and inflammation. When we get an uh, inflammation right here at the gut wall, that actually creates more separation of these epithelial cells, allowing more stuff to come on through. We talked all about this in the last presentation. So that's just a recap and to bring us into sort of the mindset of why this matters is because it all comes back to the gut. And now how do our medications affect this? Because if we've got medications that are negatively affecting this, then it's a situation where we're doing lifestyle changes, which are a step forward, but our medications might be providing us with a step or even two steps backwards uh, and as a result, we're wondering, oh, how come I'm not improving this plant-based world? This isn't working for me. It's something wrong. Well, hang on a second. Hang on a second. So what to expect in this presentation? Um, you'll see my experience with uh, some of the medications, particularly antibiotics. I'm going to talk about rheumatoid medications as an overview. I'm going to show you a slide with like all the drugs in one location. So it doesn't seem like some big black mysterious box. And then we look at a categorization that I've applied to these drugs to make it easy to see which ones are counterproductive to your gut and which ones are not. And then how to taper off the counterproductive ones. And then look at the long-term medications and, uh, and, uh, and see you know, how they can help us on our mission. A lot of them come with uh, risks of infection because they're immunomodulatory or immunosuppressant. What can we can do about that? And then we'll look at a gut-friendly medication model. How can we look at our meds knowing that we're going to be fine if we stick to a certain groupings? And there is so many horrible, ugly scientific citations that come with this presentation. I've put them all at the end. And this is a completely original presentation just for Chef AJ's audience. And therefore, I didn't spend the extra probably two hours. Um, I, I ran out of time for that to nicely reference them all off. They're all at the end. If there's trouble from the replay of trying to find specifically one, just let me know in the comments below this video later, and I'll post the link, uh, make it nice and quickly easy for you. So here we go. Uh, now, here are all or virtually all the drugs that are used in rheumatology. We've got active principle, commercial name, mechanism of action, and then the route of administration. We have a group of four medications at the top, another four here, and then another group here and here. So what we've got here are these are what I have personally categorized as short-term medications because of the way in which the manufacturer, provider has uh, has intended for the drugs to be used. So these are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and I'll get these on, get to these on the next slide too. Uh, steroids, antacids, antibiotics. And then we've got the most common drug of all in rheumatology, with is, which is methotrexate, low dose of chemotherapy. So 90% of people with rheumatoid arthritis end up taking a low dose of chemotherapy as their medication. And it, um, you know, has its fors and against. <laughs> uh, Leflamide called a raver. Sulfasalazine, a really old drug that has an antibiotic component. And then this is an antimalarial Plaquenil. Uh, again, these drugs, most of these were discovered by accident that they help with inflammatory arthritis. It's just fascinating, right? By contrast, these were all designed specifically to address uh, the autoimmune or well, actually the um, some of the cytokine responses, uh, TNF alphas here, um, Simsia, Anbrel, Symponi, Humira, Remicade. For people who've had RA for a long time and been to their rheumatologist a lot, these will be really familiar. And then some uh, some others, which uh, are injectables and also some infusions. And then these are the more recent strain of drugs, which are called JAK inhibitors. And then we've got Zelgens, Illuminant and Rinvoke, Rinvoke being the most recent to the market. For people in our community, there is a PDF version of this that you can download and keep handy, uh, which is a little bit more of an expanded version. Now, those short-term medications, these are the ones that are the counterproductive to gut health. Now, I just want to be clear. I labeled them 
short-term medications. I wonder if I can go back. Yes, I can. Okay, so I had this grouping put together by a rheumatologist who I employed for this task. And then what I noticed is I wanted to call these counterproductive drugs. I wanted to call them like, you know, something along those lines. And then I realized, you know what? The ones that are counterproductive to gut health are all designed for short-term use. And so I thought, I'm just going to go with that nomenclature. And I'm going to call these short-term and these ones long-term, which are designed for long-term use. And we'll find out shortly, don't have that same counterproductive impact on gut health. So I created for the helpfulness of my audience, let's call these short-term, let's call them long-term. All right, but that's not coming from the American guidelines uh, of rheumatology or anything. Um, that's my that's my uh, uh, system. Okay, so antibiotics, painkillers, steroids, and antacids. Let's look at the hell that these can create, all right? Okay, by the way, all are commonly used in rheumatology. Not so much antibiotics anymore, although I'll tell you a story in a second how I was exposed to those multiple times, but certainly these ones. Okay, so antibiotics. Oh my gosh, so... The odds of developing rheumatoid arthritis is 60% higher in people exposed to antibiotics just once in the past 10 years. Okay, so remember going back to that slide earlier, we're talking about what we want to have is excellent gut health um, and we want to create short chain fatty acids from healthy microbes to heal, repair the gut wall. When we take antibiotics, it is an indiscriminate abuse of our healthy microbiome flora. It wipes out the bad guys, but also the good guys. And so what we end up having is more uh, of a damaged gut, a damaged microbiome. As a consequence, we are then more likely to develop RA just from one dose of antibiotics in the last 10 years, but the likelihood of RA onset is associated with the amount of prescriptions, so it's cumulative, and increased risk with recency. So if you've just come off a course or two of antibiotics, your risk at that point is most, most greatest. So this is some serious stuff. And let's look at my history. So when I was a teenager, between the years of 1991 and 1996, I took five years of doxycycline for acne. And then in late 2005, after coming off the um, antibiotic for several years, I'd experienced digestive issues for many years. So I'd have bloating, gassiness, you know, burping, all sorts of like, you know, wind and things. And I just thought that that was kind of normal being a, in my early 20s and living off pizzas and and sometimes late night two minute noodles and things to finishing university and so on um and that went on for a while with bad digestion and then late 2005 i was asked to go and entertain the troops in iraq and do stand up comedy amongst you know the 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 allied forces and before going and then for a month there and then a month back i had to take that same doxycycline again for malaria prevention. Within a few months of getting home, I then developed rheumatoid arthritis. And then remarkably, in my first meeting with the rheumatologist, he said, I'm going to put you on doxycycline um, because there is a connection, albeit unknown, between the sort of uh, bacteria in our gut and rheumatoid arthritis. And so we, 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 there might be some evidence to use antibiotics for that. So he was on the right track, but we've since learned many years later with the diminishing use of antibiotics in rheumatology. And my experience and what I've researched is that we know the effect is there, but uh, we're better off we're better off fueling our good guys. So coming back to this slide again, there's the third bullet point which is that any antibiotic exposure associated with an increased rate of developing juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Now we're talking about young children through to their teenage years. Once again, the likelihood of JIA onset is associated with the amount of dose and recency. I want to introduce you to a beautiful friend of mine who's now an adult. Her name's Katie. 
And Katie uh, said this on an interview with me on the Rheumatoid Solutions podcast. This is her when she's only maybe two years old or something like that. She said, I was born healthy. And then at two months old, I had an ear infection. She took antibiotics. Then a couple of months later, I had another ear infection. They put me on antibiotics. Then a month after that, I had another ear infection and more antibiotics. And then a month after that, I got my first symptoms of a swollen ankle. And that was at 10 months old. I then had another ear infection. They gave me more antibiotics. And then a week after that, I got my first swollen left elbow that would later become dislocated. Then I got a viral infection about a month after that. And so I had a fever and blisters in my mouth. So they put me on more antibiotics. And then in January 1992, I was officially diagnosed with JRA. It was a month before my first birthday. Isn't that just so tragic? It's unbelievable. I mean, what a precious child to have to go through that so young. I know. And so she was then put on methotrexate. She's a low, and I, you know, anyone interested in her story, Katie's been on our podcast several times, but here's the beautiful thing. So Katie went through a lot of challenging years uh, growing up, but last uh, couple of years ago, she represented her state at Bikram Yoga and did tremendously well. She's got lots of permanent joint damage and lots of challenges, but following the Patterson program and becoming a student of the Bikram yoga style, or now called 26 and 2, uh, she's transformed her life. And she's so inspirational. And it just goes to show that, you know, even when you start out like this, you can still make changes in your life for the better. So very proud of Katie. But that is an illustration of an association of how both for Katie and I, antibiotic use can be strongly connected to the onset of this disease. Now, some people might be watching this and say, but I didn't use antibiotics, at least as much as I can remember as you guys, and I developed rheumatoid arthritis. Well, just keep in mind that a study in the UK showed that on average, uh, antibiotics are prescribed to adults once a year, once a year, every year. That's antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. Now, what's even more interesting is that antibiotics, it was found, are prescribed twice as frequently to females as to men. Now, it turns out that there is a two to one ratio of the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis amongst women to men. And Whilst there's obviously a lot of other contributors, I just feel that, you know, we need to pay close attention to our use of antibiotics because we know from the data that there is an associated risk increase every time we take antibiotics to developing this condition. So that's all we need to know. Just be discretionary uh, and, uh, and make sure there's a strong need each time. Okay, now what about if you need to take antibiotics short term? You can't avoid it because you have to. There's something that that that, that your body's not recovering from. That's fine. Um, if you need to do that, then I encourage the use of a probiotic and also lots and lots of fermented foods. So we want to be indulging in sauerkraut and kimchi if you can handle that stuff. Um, and, uh, and just miso paste, if you like, and just try to increase your fermented food intake, eating lots and lots of plants, all right? So we we don't be silly. We get whatever needs to be taken care of, taken care of with the antibiotics if necessary, but then, you know, get your gut back on track the best you can as quick as possible. Okay, now we're just going to go through the other three formats of drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So just all the side effects associated with the gut. We've got increased risk of gastrointestinal issues so like stomach ulcers, erosions, causes leaky gut, reduces bone and cartilage healing, and can increase the, the uh, uh, defects in knee cartilage. These we don't ideally want to be taking long term. And you'll notice on the box, if you own a box of it, it just says only take for two weeks. It's printed on the box. All right. So we've got to be cautious with that. To get off these, fortunately, most people are able to taper 
at least their dosage amount or even come off them altogether by following our program, which is a plant-based diet. The plants tend to reduce the risks of these problems, which in turn then allow more of a healing environment for the gut. But we want to taper them only after we've seen improvements, not in an anticipatory way. And then uh, we want to keep consistency with our doses of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. If we're following the Patterson program, then what we're after in the early stages is consistency so that we can monitor the impact of certain foods that we're introducing and so on, exercises that we're introducing. And so if we're a little bit flippant with our, our usage of these non-steroidals, then we don't know if the food caused more pain or if it's because I didn't take my drug or whatever it is. And then when it's time to taper, we taper incrementally and conservatively. I call these discretionary drugs. We don't need to ask our doctor in most cases whether or not we should take this at this dose or that dose. If that's the case for you, then this, this could apply. Okay, so this is Angelica. And I want to show you that we can come off the long-term use of these drugs using a plant-based diet. She was diagnosed in 2001. She had stiffness all over. She took ibuprofen and Tylenol. She denied the methotrexate and Plaquenil because she just didn't like the look of those. That's her story. She would say, I would take the non-steroidal in morning and night. If she forgot to take it, she would be in agony with veins in the back of her head becoming engorged. She couldn't get off the drugs. In 2017, she was watching TV. She had a nosebleed associated with the medications. It scared her. She knew it was related to the anti-inflammatory. She's already having an indigestion, heartburn, taking antacids. And she watched Clint Patterson's TED Talk. As she did the diet after a two-week period, she was able to take less and less ibuprofen. And when I interviewed her two years ago, she was able to remain off all of her non-steroidal and inflammatory medication after having taken them since 2001. Okay. So that is like an incredible amount of time to be taking these drugs and to be able to come off them in two weeks shows the power of a fiber rich diet. Can I ask you a question uh, based yes. on your success story? Because uh, yep. we have a question that came in from, from Donna, because she said that she's spoken to a lot of her friends who have the kind of things that Angel had, you know, mm -hmm. sore joints, cramps, restless legs, you know, they have confirmed rheumatoid arthritis, many are on medications. And she's spoken to them about the incredible benefits and healing that comes with a planned exclusive lifestyle. She's even sent your links, your TED talk, but she says people are still not prepared to change how they eat. They're not even willing to try. Do they need to hit rock bottom? She wants to know, she thinks it's heartbreaking. And she wondered if you had any suggestions to help people see the light or what tactics or sound bites have you found helpful? <laughs> it's a yeah, wonderful question. I, I see this within family members. I'll get emails from a wife of someone who um, has rheumatoid arthritis, and they'll say to me, "My husband, he he eats awful. The long term medications aren't working for him. He but he just believes the doctor. He doesn't want to listen to anyone else, and." he doesn't exercise, you know, how come he won't just do what you say? Because I know that it would help him so much. And <laughs> I don't have a beautiful answer for this. Uh, why do people do what they do? Why are they not able to um, take that responsibility? Or why is it too frightening to make changes? I can only say that, you know, the microbiome influences our thoughts, it influences our interest in foods and our taste buds. Therefore, you know, if you're in a state of dysbiosis, in a state of microbiome imbalance, the messages you're getting about what to eat, whether or not you should exercise, your whole attitude, it's all influenced by a dysbiotic gut. So the intervention to change that would just be to intellectually come to the decision that I'm just going to do this for two or three weeks. And then with the changes in the microbiome comes the changes in the reward system, the interest in the foods and so on. And so um, our podcast would be the place that I would send someone like that to because it's success story after success story after success story. And eventually you're like, there's 200 people telling me the same thing. 
And these are people who've been doing this for years now, not just last week, and they just happen to feel good. This is years and years of maintaining their health this way. So um, I think that'd be a good place to start. And if not, if someone's not into that, watch a fun movie like The Game Changes, where it's more enter, it's like edutainment, you know, so you can get curious that way about eating a plant based lifestyle. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, antacids. And so these are in the top 10 most used drugs in the world. We're talking about just, you know, basically heartburn pills, right? They're used for a poor diet. Everyone in our community doesn't need these drugs. People who eat our way don't need these drugs. Do you know anyone who's hardcore plant-based chef, AJ, who has to take antacids? Not really, unless they go on a cruise or something and have a bad right. diet. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, so this is really for a poor diet or to compensate for the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because they, they tend to assist against the side effects of the previous drug. So it's a drug for drug usage. And that's a double negative because these ones increase pathogenic gut bacteria and they increase the risk of death at regular dose, the dose that you go and get from the local pharmacy. Again, all the references are at the back of this presentation. So our tapering plan here. Now, imbalanced acid production should resolve on a plant-based diet. Okay. And if it hasn't, it's because your plant-based diet is still maybe contains processed foods or foods that are not as gentle as what's in our program. So we've got specific diet for, uh, you know, inflammation reduction that I went through in the last presentation. Okay. So PPI, these are proton pump inhibitors. Proton pump inhibitor usage should be not necessary in due course. And you can gradually reduce the dosage as symptoms abate. You shouldn't be coming off these quick. Uh, this is basically a very, very slow transition. I heard Dr. Michael Clapper uh, explain this uh, at one of the events I did with him in Florida a few years ago. You can't be coming off these quickly, just very, very slow. And then rarely after two months, should you be needing those. So if you've come off your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and then you're able to come off this, you've, you've created the most wonderful opportunity for your gut to then receive the gifts of your lifestyle changes. Now, I've got about five slides here, Chef AJ, all about the side effects of steroids. I don't want to bore everyone because some people, if they're on them, they're going to be motivated by basically the first bullet point. Um, but I want everyone just to understand the sheer vastness of the negative impacts of steroid use. And about 50% of the RA population are on steroids, according to a recent study. That's a lot of people. But steroids should be thought of like a space saver tire on your car, one of those modern car uh, tires that you get out of your trunk when you've had a flat. It's not a regular tire. It's a space saver tire. It's designed to get you out of an emergency and get you back home where you can be safe. You don't then drive the space saver tire around as a permanent part of your car for the next 12, 24 months. Okay. The American College of Rheumatology Guidelines a couple of years ago said we should be using or should be prescribing steroids to patients at the lowest cumulative dose possible for the shortest possible time because of the high awareness of potentially adver associated adverse effects. Okay, so what I'm saying here isn't controversial. I am pulling this information directly from the science and all the rheumatologists that we have on our live monthly calls support this position because they've read the guidelines and they've seen this for themselves. So you can see on the screen here, they disturb the, the, uh, the gastrointestinal uh, environment. They disturb the gut microbiome, put it into a more disease-like state. They upregulate bacteria that's associated with inflammation. Uh, they upregulate pathogenic bacteria, reduce metabolism function, uh, meaning the way that you uh, burn your energy. And um, steroids and painkillers act negatively on prostaglandin formation, which promotes gastric mucus production. So we're impacting the ability to create mucus as a protective layer over our gut lining. And let's just fly through these. Um, uh, so we've got a chance of increasing gastrointestinal bleeding, uh, especially when they're used together with non-steroidals. Steroids and non-steroidals are a nightmare. Um, it, they decrease bone mineral density. 
um, reducing, uh, vi creating vitamin D deficiency, um, increased risk of infection, which is a concern when you have rheumatoid because you're on immunomodulating or immunosuppressant drugs. A big study showed that when they are used in parallel with these uh, biologic drugs, prednisone increases the risk of infection by two and a half times, um, increases the RA sensitivity to stress. So we become sensitive to interpersonal conflicts and so forth. Uh, and you can read on about psychiatric adverse reactions um, and other commonly known things that are generic to use outside of rheumatoid, facial rounding and all of these other unpleasantries. To summarize, in a 25-year review, prednisone use has a significantly increased risk of death with people with rheumatoid arthritis. We don't want to be on these things long-term. As per the American College Guidelines of Rheumatology, they're the shortest possible time at the lowest possible dose. All right? So Dr. Alan Desmond, friend of ours, Chef AJ, uh, on a podcast uh, with myself, uh, said steroid medications have a host of negative side effects on human health. Um, he lists several of those. He says, I do prescribe steroids, but when we prescribe steroids with gastroenterology, which is what he is, a gastroenterologist, we would usually prescribe them for a 12-week maximum. And we have to put someone on steroids more than twice a year, then we have to rethink our approach because we only want to use steroids for a short-term intervention. There's the gastroenterologist who is an expert on bowel health. Dr. Paul Goldberg, who runs the Goldberg Tenor Clinic out of Atlanta, Georgia, has this on his website. And I love this statement. He says, the longer a patient has been on steroids and the more they have taken, the greater the health recovery challenge is. Reversing the downward health spiral from long-term steroid use is neither simple nor quick. Patients must understand that perseverance and long-term effort will be required if the downward trend is to be reversed and health is to be regained. The longer one stays on steroids, the more times prescriptions are employed, the less the opportunity becomes to return to dependable health. Um, so that is a, a statement from uh, Goldberg Tenor Clinic, which, uh, and they've been on our podcast in the past and our live calls and uh, lovely fellows. So what about, Okay, playing the playing reality here. What if your doctor says, but no other drug for you works for you except steroids, right? That's the statement. Well, that's fine, but utilize all the science supported lifestyle strategies to keep steroid use as low as possible. Because in this interview series that we're doing here with Chef AJ, I'm going to be talking about so many ways that you can reduce inflammation. There's so many tools in the toolkit. And therefore, there's ways other than the drug to reduce inflammation. You should do all of them with enthusiasm to keep your steroid use at a minimum. Plus, if you improve your gut health, we'll talk about just in a moment, this can improve the efficacy of long-term drugs, which are suitable, and therefore enable you to transition more successfully. What if your doctor says, we need prednisone as a bridging drug to get you from where you are until a disease-modifying drug works? And I'll, we're talking about these in a moment. Well, that's fine. Um, but work on all the lifestyle efforts once again to ensure that that bridge doesn't turn into a road and then that road turn into a highway and a highway of constant steroid use year after year after year. Okay. Now there's an argument amongst rheumatology that says, oh, but natural dose of steroid in the body might be five milligram. They say that st long-term studies have shown you know, uh, under that condition that some of the impacts are acceptable. But I would argue that uh, is the research focused on gut health? And that's what I'm focused on, all right? Because we're looking, I want to see the impacts on the gut. And if we can do something other than steroids, then I think everyone agrees, according to the science and according to college guidelines of rheumatology, that there are better alternatives. So tapering off steroids is not easy. Normally, I observe people have to replace it with a disease-modifying drug or biologic drug that's suitable for long-term. So you actually have to do a switch out. And then inside our program, eat the simple baseline foods, 
double down on potassium intake. We have a mega potassium smoothie because um, potassium is linked to the body's natural cortisol production. We want to stimulate that. Uh, there's an argument around adrenal fatigue because if you become dependent on an external steroid, then your body's ability to create its own becomes a question mark. So this isn't actually accepted as, as fact amongst the medical science. So you've got to be careful here what's considered fact and what's just theory. But um, we've, we've dem the science has demonstrated that potassium intake has reduced inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So from that known fact, we can increase potassium. And then we want to increase exercise and optimize our cell membrane composition. Things that we can talk about in other episodes of Chef AJ Live. <laughs> uh, here's, here's someone who's followed these strategies and has actually uh, been able to successfully come off all medications. It's just to illustrate that it is possible and can be done with your rheumatologist. I was officially diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and they started me on the course of drugs, which I'll get into in more detail. And um, eventually I just decided there's gotta be something more to this. Like if I did this to myself over the course of years, whether it be through medications I was on as a kid or just eating processed foods, there's gotta be a way that my body will heal and just really had the fight to find another way. And found you and started the program and within two weeks felt, so much better and then over the course of the last year um i celebrated one year off of being all my drugs um all my medications last month and i'm celebrating that like ah uh, that's huge so that's shelly you can watch her episode on the rheumatoid solutions podcast and learn about how she got off particularly steroids early which is a particularly a hard drug to get off and once again i want to underline this is not a drug bashing presentation in and 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 putting a a story to illustrate someone who's gotten off their medications isn't to celebrate the fact that medications are bad and therefore we want to get off them it's not that at all we just want to illustrate that if we are focused on our gut health then we can reduce some of the underlying cause of the condition and maybe with a collaboration with your rheumatologist you might find that your dosage can be adjusted. Now I'm going to actually talk about long-term medications, which can be supportive for uh, your mission with optimal health and minimum symptoms with rheumatoid. So this is a pro medication section of the presentation. And we're talking about here drugs that are disease modifying drugs, biologic drugs, JAK inhibitors and infusions. Now, there's very little research on the effect of these drugs on gut health. I can only find a few studies on this. Uh, generally, it's not of great interest to the, to the scientific community. It is to me. I want to see how they affect gut health because that's where we want to spend a lot of time healing. Um, but methotrexate, sulfasalazine and Plaquenil all potentially helpful to lower leaky gut via inflammation reduction mechanism. So those three drugs here generally considered helpful. Remicade, one of the TNF alpha drugs, improved leaky gut in Crohn's patients. And so therefore the long-term drugs are likely helpful for the healing mission via the mechanism of inflammation reduction because inflammation is the number one problem to increase gut permeability. So what we need to think about with long-term medications is like if we've got a broken leg, you can't heal a broken leg if you keep walking on it. So we can't heal a leaky gut if it's always got inflammation. And the inflammation anywhere in the body is associated with inflammation at the gut wall. So they go hand in hand, all right? So if you're highly inflamed, you've got an inflamed gut wall and gut permeability. So what we can do is we can we can use a set of crutches to take the weight off of the broken leg while it heals. And at some point in the future, under this metaphor, that leg can get by with one crutch and maybe in the future, no crutches. Now, with the healing the gut, the medications can provide that inflammation reduction, but a, leak, a, 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 a gut dysbiosis is a very severe broken leg. This can take a very long period of time. And therefore, we can't expect that 
it is a given that at some point we come off our drugs and so forth. That may not occur to for for a uh, a significant portion of the population. Avoiding long term drugs by having a hero mentality or uh, being defiant or just not being into drugs and just having a disdain towards them can create more problems due to the high inflammation that persists compared to even the side effects of the drugs. And in fact, you know, people can become very medication adverse in our community, wanting to do everything naturally. I used to be in that camp as well. And then I realized, you know what, like you ultimately fail if you persist with high inflammation because you can't heal the gut and your joints are getting destroyed. So it's just not a good strategy. If you're asking the question, can you reverse RA symptoms without drugs? It all comes down to levels of inflammation. If you look like the gentleman on the left and you've got inflammation in all multiple joints, then it's going to be probably beyond what's you know physically possible. Um, but if you look like the person on the right and you may only have you know a little little bit of inflammation, a little bit of a knuckle or a foot, maybe it's possible. For example, Jennifer. So her rheumatologist is familiar with our program. Her rheumatologist saw her and she had mild symptoms. And so she rheumatologist said, look, I'm not going to give you drugs. I want you to go and do this program. She went and did the program. And then six months later, her C-reactive protein was below one. It's meant to only be below five. Hers is below one. And the rheumatologist discharged her and she hasn't seen her since. She says, apart from one or two episodes where I've eaten incorrectly, I've been completely symptom-free and medication-free from rheumatoid arthritis. Now, in the medical community, this typically never occurs, right? Even low symptoms are treated aggressively with drugs. But here's an example of someone with low symptoms, given a lifestyle approach that works and became symptom-free long-term. So it is possible. But the key comes back to, how inflamed are you? So don't exhaust more than two to three months without a long-term drug if all the natural strategies that you're deploying aren't enough, right? Don't go year after year after year persisting, trying to say, I can beat this, I can get this inflammation under control if you're highly inflamed because the odds are all stacked against you. So here is a, a gut-friendly medication model. So the first step, let's get inflammation down as quickly as possible. Use all the natural strategies that are available to you, all of which are inside our plan. And then if they're not enough, then get onto a sensible long-term medication. Uh, step number two, with the sensible long-term medication and all the natural strategies, you should hopefully be able to come off the short-term drugs, which are going to prevent a lot of the um, progress that you're aiming for. And then step number three, build your lifestyle skills. Become a master of strength building. Become a master of plant-based cooking. Work out how to make the foods more delicious. Expand your food base. Improve the diversity of your microbiome. Work on your mental health. Become happier. Do all the things that support good lifestyle practices. Number four, demonstrate control. Show at your blood tests that you've got your inflammation right down. And with the imaging that's done with your specialist, show that hopefully show that your erosions are not progressing in your affected joints. And then you can have a discussion with the doctor. You know what? Like, do I need as much medication as what I'm taking? And can we explore a change? And if you've done all these things and you're a master of your condition, then this conversation will be quite welcomed by the doctor who finds your case very different to most of his patients or his or her patients and potentially explore this. So consider this. And again, this is not medical advice. Right? And, and, and I may invite criticism that I'm even talking about medications not being a medical doctor, but that's okay because I'm here to serve folks who are interested in healing their gut. And, and I believe this is a, this is a good way to, to go about it. And all of this involves common sense and conversations with your doctor. See, discuss with doctor, uh, discuss with doctor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, what about risks? <laughs> what about risks of infection? What comes up at this point um, in conversations in our support group, if I if I put forward this this set of cards and say, 
and look, you're doing all these wonderful things. And yes, yeah, you're going great with all your lifestyle, but you know, you're, uh, you've still got inflammation and, and the question comes back, but I'm terrified of infection. And it's true. I have listed on here, all of the infection facts, the re reality of infections on uh, biologic and JAK inhibitor style drugs. It's true. But guess what? You're going to be eating a plant-based diet and a plant-based diet reduces the infection risk of many of the specific concerns that come up with those particular drugs like tuberculosis and shingles and so on. And so on my screen here, you can see a list of ways in which a plant-based diet reduces the risk of those same exact things like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, reduces shingles, has been proven to the treatment of tuberculosis, helpful for tuberculosis. It can uh, uh, boost natural immunity, manage symptoms and prevent or diminish hepo toxicity associated with tuberculosis drugs and some species are being investigated uh, for actually inhibiting um, tuberculosis uh, development so we've got a strategy that works against the number one concern of going on those drugs so people then say okay now i'm on a long-term drug and i want to get off it because i'm doing so well can i now get off the drug and Again, this is back to the discussion with the rheumatologist, but I just want everyone who's in that position, who's who's got a great lifestyle and the medication is working for them, everything's going well, don't be too quick to ask for a taper because we want to celebrate the lack of drama. With rheumatoid arthritis, when you've got uncontrolled inflammation, it is a living nightmare. And so if we can get years and years of low inflammation, controlled disease state, and uh, you know, feeling in a state of remission, if you like, there's a wonderful place to be. Life's good in that circumstances, okay? So there's a reason to celebrate improved health, but there's no trophy for coming off medications. It's not going to get you a fanfare of any kind Okay, so it is only a consequence of all the hard work you put in. It's not a goal in amongst itself. But if you want, have a chat with your rheumatologist, work closely with her or him about your levels of meds. But to thrive, to really thrive with rheumatoid, we need more than drugs typically. So an article that was published in the Journal of Rheumatology monitored 466 RA patients over three years. Patients were on established medications for at least six months and were allowed analgesics, non-steroidal painkillers. Uh, they were allowed steroid injections into their joints. They were allowed to be on Plaquenil, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, or leflunamide, and be able to take steroids up to 7.5 milligrams per day. After three years, many of their disease uh, indicative markers were worse than at the beginning, even under this model. The researchers said it proved hard to suppress C-reactive protein levels. So if you're only going with a drug model and you're not addressing the underlying cause and all the other contributors to dysbiosis, if you're not addressing the physical need to move joints to reduce inflammation and all of the other aspects, you're going to find it hard to suppress C-reactive protein levels, even under a complete medical model such as the one described. So uh, if anyone wants help, uh, we can assist you with providing that complete 360 degree approach to this condition. Inside Rheumatoid Solutions, we've got the dietary side of things covered in full with the Patterson program. We will also, uh, inside Rheumatoid Solutions, support you with guidelines around all other aspects of the condition. And this is like a Netflix library of nearly a thousand quick how-to videos solving problems for RA patients. And then each month we have live calls with rheumatologists and other medical doctors and interviews with them and live Q&A. So you can get answers about your condition directly from the specialists who are holistic, who understand a lot more about the lifestyle interventions. So that concludes today's presentation. And I've got a ton of very ugly slides now, which are all of the references. 
Now I'm going to just click through these one at a time. There's 13 pages of these. If anyone has trouble finding one in particular, again, just pop the comment in the uh, section below and I'll be able to then direct you quickly to the right one by posting the relevant one. So we're on page seven, eight. Obviously you can pause the video as you need to be able to grab the one that you're looking for. And you can see the title of the study is included and therefore you should be able to match the title to what I presented earlier. That's reference number 13. That is the end of the presentation, Chef AJ. That's fabulous. You know, when, when I'm watching your presentation, I'm thinking, you know, there obviously is a time and place for medications, but it seems like, especially with these autoimmune diseases, that it doesn't really cure the person. It just alleviates some symptoms. Yes. And that is absolutely the case. The drugs are not a cure. The disease remains under the, certainly under the category of incurable. And what we're trying to do with all of our approaches, lifestyle, drug, or otherwise, is just to develop a sense of control over the condition. We're looking for ideally no symptoms, no joint erosion and progression. So that's what we're after. But you could see it's hard to do it, even with a big portfolio of medications. And it's very hard to do without medications. And so it's a Goliath of a challenge. And we got to throw everything at it. I just like the concept of it doesn't matter if it's the diet that's working or the drugs that are working. If you don't know, just get everything aligned, get inflammation down, and then let's learn this. Let's let's just basically throw throw everything at it because it's such an ugly beast. And then with time, we can uh, review all aspects of it. But first step, low inflammation. Yeah. Well, people that are getting these diseases from the medication, I mean, is it is their recovery or treatment any different than people that got it, less, let's say, from dietary reasons? No, well, we cannot definitively say where anyone got it. Obviously, with me, there's a big association with antibiotic use and Katie, a big association with antibiotic use. But I know how scientists and medical professionals think. And you can still only word, use the word association. You cannot say that antibiotics caused it because that is still just too strong a statement. What we can say from the science is that antibiotics cause disruption to the microbiome. We can say from the science that microbiome disruption is associated with rheumatoid arthritis development. And we can say that therefore, you know, there is a strong association. So, Everyone else who doesn't feel that antibiotics was involved in their um, disease development can also see that even eating a high fat Western diet that's rich in seed oils, processed foods, animal products, and being having a sediment, uh, sedentary lifestyle, these things alone are risk factors to developing disease. And so it might not have been a, a dysbiosis through drug intervention, but dysbiosis can be uh, created through other lifestyle factors too.